Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Here's a fun question that not only have I myself asked, but I actually get asked this quite often. Why do we hear a call out like Roger Roll or Roll Program Complete, at which point we see the rocket rotate or roll on its X axis? Good power. Come on. Clear. 12 seconds out, the roll program has commenced. The best example of this, I think, was the space shuttle, which had a really obvious and really dramatic roll program. As soon as it cleared the tower, you can see it making a very impressive and sometimes scary looking roll. Now, a maneuver like this makes sense when a vehicle's asymmetrical, like a space shuttle. But why do cylindrical rockets like a Saturn V or Titan or Atlas or Delta IV, why do they even bother doing a roll? I mean, can't rockets just tip over and go in whatever direction they need to go? Do a little pitch here, a little yaw there. As long as the pointy end is going in the direction it's intended to go, who cares which side of the rocket is facing the Earth and which side is facing space, right? So today, first we'll define the pitch, yaw, roll, and their corresponding axes on a rocket. Then we're going to dive into why a rocket rolls in the first place, take a look at launch azimuths and their relationships to trajectories, and then we'll look at some unique solutions to orientations, including some rockets that don't roll on ascent to align with their trajectories at all. Let's get started. Three, two, one, and This is one of those topics I love, where at first the reason feels kind of perplexing. Then you hear one explanation and you're like, oh, I guess that makes sense. But then you think of some other reasons and learn of all these weird little edge cases and come to find out there's actually a lot to unpack here. And just to clarify things, we're specifically talking about the roll program of rockets and not their gravity turn. These are two totally different things. We're focusing on this, not this. This, not this. So let's start off with a quick overview of pitch, yaw, and roll, and how they correspond on a rocket. You may have heard the terms pitch, yaw, and roll, especially when talking about airplanes. On an airplane, pitch is the nose pulling up or diving down, yaw is the nose going left or right, and roll, you can think of the wing tips going up or down while the nose stays in the same place. With airplanes, it's really easy to define pitch, yaw, and roll because airplanes have really obvious characteristics like wings, landing gear, a cockpit, and a vertical stabilizer. And you might think, how do you define these dimensions on a cylindrical rocket? Although a rocket is pretty symmetrical, it's still vital to define these dimensions. I mean, otherwise your rocket might go north instead of east or something. So let's take a jetliner and just remove the wings and tail stabilizer. Hey, look, the fuselage kind of looks like a rocket. Perfect. So now we still have our pitch, yaw, and roll. We just stand this baby up on its tail and let it rip. This was literally true when cockpits were put on missiles, which is basically all the Vostok, Mercury, Gemini, Soyuz programs were. So now with a rocket on the launch pad, we can look at the cockpit for that same pitch, yaw, and roll. When sitting in the cockpit, your pitch or your nose up and down is rotating on the Y axis, yawing left or right is rotating on the Z axis, and rolling left or right is on the X axis. Unlike an airplane, the pitch, yaw, and roll of a rocket generally isn't controlled by wings or fins, but it's actually controlled by the engine itself via a gimbal and perhaps some auxiliary thrusters to help control roll. However, wings and fins are sometimes used for stability in the atmosphere. A single engine on the bottom of a rocket can only provide two axes of control, that's pitch and yaw. And this is because the engine goes through the center of the rocket. Because of that, it can only apply torque on two axes. So in order for most single engine rockets to have roll control, you'll normally see auxiliary thrusters stuck on the side or the outer perimeter of the rocket. These auxiliary thrusters are called vernier thrusters, and I think they're the most obvious on the original Atlas SM-65A rocket. And there's several vernier thrusters on the bottom of the Soyuz rockets as well. But some single-engined rockets get clever and control their roll via the gas generator exhaust, like the RS-68 on the Delta IV and Delta IV Heavy. You can see the engineers cleverly point and steer the dual gas generator exhaust on each side of the engine for roll control. Now, if you need to brush up on gas generator cycles and the open cycle, I recently did a really in-depth rundown of a few common engine cycles in my Is SpaceX's Raptor Engine the King of Rocket Engines video. Both rockets that have at least two engines or at least two combustion chambers like the RD-180 on the Atlas V, you can point the engines in opposite directions, which will induce your X-axis roll. Okay, so now that we know how a rocket can control its roll, 
Now we can get into why a rocket needs to control its roll. Well, to begin, a rocket needs to remain stable throughout flight so it doesn't spin so fast it tears itself apart. I mean, okay, sure, that's the most basic reason of why the rocket needs to control its roll, but we still get to the question of why do they intentionally roll once they get off the launch pad? So I'm gonna tell you the reason here, then we're gonna dive in and I'm going to define a few more things. The rocket rolls to align itself to its flight azimuth, so its flight path becomes a simple pitch program. <laughs> we have a lot to unpack in just that one sentence, huh? So first, let's talk about the azimuth. Now, depending on the destination of the payload, rockets need to head to a very specific orbit. And a fun reminder here, I like to say to go to space, you go up, but to stay in space, you need to go sideways really, really fast, which really that's all orbit is. And now to get to your desired orbit, you wanna make sure that that sideways part of your flight is pointing in a very, very specific and accurate direction. Now, if you were to launch a rocket right on the equator straight east, not only would you take full advantage of the Earth's rotation, which gives the rocket a nice little boost, but you'd also place your vehicle on a zero degree inclination. It's like a nice little belt around the Earth's equator. Or another fun example of inclination is the International Space Station, which is on a 51.6 degree inclination. Now it's on this exact inclination so the Russians can participate and they can launch without dropping boosters on China or without doing a costly dogleg maneuver. And just as a reference, if you launched straight east out of Kennedy Space Center, you'd be on a 28.6 degree inclination, which you may notice is the exact latitude of the Space Center. So here's where we get to what your azimuth is. The azimuth is basically if you're holding a compass on the launch pad, which direction do you want the rocket to go to get to your desired orbit? But we should pause here for a second and clear up one thing because this definitely confused me a bit. Let's be sure and note the difference between the azimuth and the inclination. The azimuth is what's on the nav ball inside a cockpit. You know, north on the nav ball is zero degrees, while east is 90, south is 180 degrees, and west is 270. Now this does not line up with the inclinations. A zero degree inclination is due east on the equator while a polar orbit is inclined 90 degrees. But again, minimum inclination depends on your latitude. So flying due east will only correspond to a zero degree inclination if you're launching on the equator. And another side note, all prograde orbits or orbits that follow the rotation of the Earth are between zero and 90 degrees inclination. If the rocket is flying south from the equator, it's still between zero and 90 degrees because inclination is really just a measure in degrees how far off angle the orbit is from the equator. And of course, it's not quite just as simple as this. If you wanna to go to 51.6 degrees and rendezvous with the International Space Station, you don't actually point at 51.6 degrees, you actually point at about 45 degrees. But now we're getting into some kind of fun math that takes into account the Earth's rotation and spherical trigonometry, which might be getting a little too far into the weeds for this video. So now that we know that rockets don't all follow the same path to get to space and to their destinations, we're starting to get some of the puzzle pieces as to why they might intentionally roll. For our next clue, we need to look no further than the launch pads themselves. And since we've mentioned rockets like the Space Shuttle and the Saturn V, Let's take a look at one of the most famous launch pads in the world. A launch pad that saw lots of launches from both these vehicles and now SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Of course, I'm talking about Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. LC-39A is a great example because it's perfectly aligned north, south, east, and west. Take a look here. We can see the flame trench and the crawler way perfectly runs north and south. So let's start off with the Saturn V, which first launched from 39A on its inaugural test flight on November 9th, 1967, and last launched Skylab on May 14th, 1973. With vehicle crawled out on the pad, you'll see the launch umbilical tower on the north side with its crew axis arm that swings around and connects to the east side of the rocket. This is where the astronauts get in, and once they're in, they're facing with the top of their heads due east and their feet due west. So of course, along with the command module, the rest of the vehicle had certain features, such as the fuel and electrical umbilicals that connected the rocket to the launch umbilical tower. It had some external raceways, which had some important wiring and all that kind of stuff. But most importantly, when talking about the alignment of the rocket, was a thing called the IMU. The IMU, or the instrument unit, sat on top of the Saturn V's third stage, which housed the rocket's guidance systems. This included a digital computer, 
pretty big deal at the time, an analog flight control computer, accelerometers, and some gyroscopes. So in the case of the Saturn V heading to the moon, the launch azimuth was 72 degrees, which is 18 degrees north of due east. So while on the launch pad, the flight path and the belly of the rocket were 18 degrees off from each other. And here's where we get to the first reason for the roll program. Now, instead of moving the entire launch pad to just face the belly of the rocket at that 18 degree angle, the rocket could simply perform a roll to basically zero out the difference between the flight path and the body's physical coordinates. It would have a value that's a nice, easy zero. Now, all the rocket has to do is pitch over. This made it so the computer really only had to calculate one set of numbers instead of two, making the math and the calculations much, much easier. Less variables equals a good thing. It's nice to keep it simple. Another physical consideration is a thing called gimbal lock. Now, gimbals can freely rotate on all three dimensions and align themselves to a fixed position in space, which can then tell the guidance computers where the vehicle is pointing. Now, by zeroing out one of those numbers, you're keeping the gimbal as far away from potential gimbal lock as possible. And a gimbal that locks up can be a very, very bad thing. So in order to demonstrate why zeroing out a vehicle's roll is a good thing, let's just build a quick rocket in Kerbal Space Program. Now, by default, when you build a rocket, it's aligned perfectly north, south, east, and west, with pitch aligned north and south, and yaw aligned east and west. So to head out on an equatorial zero degree inclination orbit, you need to press only a single key, the right amount. And in this example, that is the D key, which will yaw over due east. Just one finger flying, nice and easy. Now let's rotate the rocket about 20 degrees or so away from being perfectly aligned and still try and follow that perfectly zero degree inclination due east. Now, this can still easily be done when you're super, super talented like me, obviously, <laughs> but all kidding aside, you're only using two keys this time, but it is noticeably harder. So why not just keep it simple? Well, here's another example that's a fun thought experiment. This is a map of downtown Waterloo, Iowa. Notice that the streets run from northeast to southwest and from northwest to southeast, and they're aligned to the river and not aligned to true north. Now, if you're walking around, it's probably unlikely that you wouldn't just redefine your own coordinates in your head and start thinking of anything on this side of the river as north and anything on this side as south. It just makes navigating a lot easier than thinking about northeast and southwest. So if the rocket and the launch pad are always in a fixed position, which, spoiler alert, they pretty much always are, well, kind of, we'll talk about that more in a second. The easiest thing to do is to program the rocket to do a quick roll to align itself with its azimuth. This takes the navigation from being a three-dimensional equation to just a two-dimensional equation and removes a ton of complexity and variables. I know it doesn't seem like much, but it definitely matters. Now, of course, whether the vehicle pitches or yaws is a bit pedantic because doesn't someone just define that? <laughs> Well, there's still some other important distinctions. Sticking with Apollo, the astronauts' heads were pointing due east on the launch pad. They were actually on the belly of the Saturn V. But here's a fun fact. Do you actually know the command module and the Saturn V had exactly opposite Y and Z coordinates? I don't exactly know why, but I think that's kind of interesting. But this meant when the rocket pitched over, the commander could look out the small port window in the blast protective cover and get a visual reference of their orientation. So by zeroing out the roll, the horizon would appear across the window, which made it easy to use as a reference. This also made it so if the commander saw the ground suddenly coming up or the horizon spinning, they may have considered aborting or at least had a good visual reference on whether or not that'd be necessary. Another reason why there's usually a defined belly of a rocket is to place the radio antennas and the receivers in the optimal place to have best contact with the ground during ascent. This is especially true with the space shuttle, which if it had ascended with the orbiter on top of the external fuel tank, it would have had a much worse line of sight. While we're talking about the space shuttle, its roll program was even more necessary due to its unique shape. Not only was it structurally the best option for the wings and the struts holding the external fuel tank, but by flying with the orbiter in the wake of the external fuel tank, there was actually a 20% increase in payload capacity. And although most rockets look relatively symmetrical, they almost always have some kind of protruding feature. I mean, take a look at the Saturn V. It had very large bumps and bulges on the outside that definitely aren't insignificant when factoring in the ascent profile. You'll see these areas where additional piping or wiring is housed inside sections called raceways. 
You notice there are two different raceways on each side of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy cores. You can tell the two outer cores of the Falcon Heavy are 180 degrees opposite of each other because of those two different raceways. But back to the space shuttle. The shuttle controlled its pitch and roll via gimbling nozzles on the solid rocket boosters. I mean, yes, the main space shuttle engines could gimbal too, and gimbal a lot, but they primarily gimbaled to maintain the center of thrust going through the center of mass. By using the solid rocket boosters to control pitch, the gimbal vectors are in line with each other relative to the center of mass. This probably makes it easier to control. This is also relevant to multi-core rockets like the Falcon Heavy and the Delta IV Heavy, which both have a roll program which again aligns the cores kind of perpendicular to the flight path. Now this might not be a huge deal or not, but let's just take a look at a vehicle like this and if it were flying with its engines in a row perpendicular to the horizon, the engines that are on the top and the bottom would have a different amount of leverage over the vehicle compared to that center engine or center core. So I'm not entirely sure, but I think this might be another reason why they normally fly pretty parallel to the horizon. But they also fly with these rockets flat to the horizon for stage separation, so the boosters have the lowest chances of hitting the center core. Okay, so now while we're on the topic of the Falcon Heavy and SpaceX, here's a fun little fact. The Falcon 9 does not perform a roll program to align to its azimuth, and neither does the Electron rocket. Both the Falcon 9 and the Electron just pitch and yaw over however much is necessary and roll for aerodynamic considerations and a few other variables as well. But controlling a rocket in a true 3D space like this is actually a lot harder than it sounds. It took a generation of grad students to actually solve the linear algebra and have access to computers powerful enough on the rockets to do this math in real time for this type of control. So if the Falcon 9 and the Electron rockets don't need to roll, why do they? Well, apparently for fun. Ugh. So I totally got trolled here by Elon. Because on June 12th, 2019, SpaceX launched a trio of satellites for the Canadian Space Agency. Soon after liftoff, the Falcon 9 did a pretty substantial roll. Now again, rockets aren't actually symmetrical, and although the Falcon 9 can navigate along both axes, it's likely that this particular launch had a role like this due to some payload considerations. Customers might have certain constraints, and with this particular launch having an offset payload, perhaps they needed to fly it in a certain way for the payload to best handle the G-forces. The Falcon 9 is also perhaps a little unique in that it for sure wants to be oriented correctly at stage separation, so the first stage has both of its nitrogen thrusters able to help do that flip maneuver. Since the Falcon 9 has only two packs of cold gas thrusters that are 180 degrees apart from each other, this means if the vehicle rotated 90 degrees, only one set of thrusters could help with the flip instead of two. Or here's another fun story. Have you ever seen the very first Falcon 9 launch? It unintentionally rolled almost 45 degrees immediately after takeoff. This was due to the gas generator exhaust that has a slight angle to it. So just like how the Delta IV's RS-68 uses its gas generators to roll, the nine Merlin engines had so much extra torque from the gas generator's exhaust, it took a second for the engine gimbals to cancel the roll out. And one more reason why rockets roll is for the fairing separation. Now, I don't exactly know what considerations go into choosing whether the fairing would split on its y-axis or its z-axis, but it should be noted that this is definitely taken into consideration. For instance, from what I can tell at least, SpaceX tends to ditch their fairings on its y-axis or up and down, while ULA tends to ditch its fairings off to the sides on its z-axis. Why exactly each launch provider chooses to ditch them in this manner? I'm not sure, but it's kind of fun to note. So a few 21st century rockets finally took the roll to align to the azimuth program out, but perhaps my favorite rockets that didn't roll line were Soviet era rockets. Remember near the beginning when I said it'd be too hard to turn the rocket and or the launch pad to align with its trajectory? Well, that's actually exactly what the Soviet Union came up with for their R7 family of rockets like the Soyuz. That's right, the entire launch pad of the Soyuz actually rotates to align the rocket up with its azimuth. Now some downsides to this is your azimuth might change ever so slightly throughout your launch window. So by aligning the launch pad to your azimuth, you might lose some flexibility in the launch window and flight path. This is something the new Soyuz 2 can do away with now that it has a digital flight computer and it can now align itself on the correct azimuth. Although crewed missions still use a Soyuz FG, which utilizes that rotating table. But lastly, there was still perhaps the most advanced, most ahead of its time rocket, the Soviet Union's N1 rocket, which was meant to, <coughs> never did, 
follow its flight path using both pitch and yaw. It had some roll control thrusters that were undersized for the first three launches and then upgraded for the fourth launch, but they weren't used to align to the azimuth, they were just used for stability. <sighs> I still really wish the N1 had worked out. It's such an awesome rocket. So to summarize, rockets roll for a few reasons. And like all rocket science and engineering, there's actually some good reasons. But as for why, well, it's generally easier to roll to align the vehicle to its azimuth than it is to move the launch pad. It makes for easier calculations for the guidance computer. Rockets roll for aerodynamic and structural considerations. They roll for the astronaut's vantage point and visual references. They roll for fairing deployment orientation. They roll to align auxiliary or control thrusters. And they roll for best line of sight for communications and downlinks. <sighs> so does this help answer that question? It's another one of those fun things where you probably know there's a good reason, but it's just kind of hard to find all those good reasons. Hopefully this helps us appreciate just how many of these little but important decisions engineers and scientists need to come up with every single day. There's always a reason for all the strange little quirks. Let me know what other questions you have about rural programs or rockets or rocket science in general in the comments below. I have a crazy long list I'm still trying to chew away at here for videos, so stay tuned. There's still a million things to learn. I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for literally being right here in my Discord channel right now, still fact checking a few things in this actual video. So if you like to help fact check or find little fun quirks and do all these other things like provide feedback for videos and have voting on upcoming videos and things like that, please consider becoming a Patreon member where you'll gain access to our exclusive Discord channel, exclusive live streams, and our exclusive subreddit by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Seriously, thank you. I couldn't make these videos without my Patreon supporters. While you're online, definitely check out my web store where you can find things like this full flow stage combustion cycle shirt and a ton of other new things. And don't forget, I actually do runs of shirts now. I don't do like print on demand. So if you see a shirt that you like, uh, it might not be there in a month. So just keep that in mind and stop back often, uh, especially as new releases come out because they can sell out really quickly. And while you're there, you can listen to my music too by clicking on the music tab or listen to it on iTunes or Spotify. Everything in my videos is always original music. So check it out, put it on a playlist for the summer. Let me know what you think. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to earth for everyday people.